Hi, my name is David Warner Matheson, and for the past nine years I've been exploring and writing about the connection between the myths and the stars. I've now written eight books, each with more than 300 pages and most with over 400 pages, and all with more than 100 images and star charts examining the overwhelming amount of evidence which points to the conclusion that all the world's ancient myths scriptures, and sacred stories from virtually every culture on every inhabited continent and island are speaking a language of celestial metaphor. And even with all the content in those eight books, plus dozens of videos, and well over a thousand blog posts, I've only scratched the surface of the world's myths. Based on my analysis, I am absolutely convinced, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the world's ancient myths and scriptures, including the characters and stories in the Bible, as well as the Greek myths, the Norse myths, the myths of ancient Egypt, ancient India, ancient China and Japan, the stories and sacred traditions of the cultures of Australia and Africa, Europe and Asia, the Americas and the Pacific are all built on a common system, a worldwide system of celestial metaphor. By this, I mean that they're all describing the motions and characteristics of very specific constellations. Jesus in the stories of the New Testament corresponds to a specific constellation. And David, or Moses, or Solomon, Melchizedek, in the stories of the Old Testament, correspond to specific constellations or sets of constellations as well. The gods of ancient Greece correspond to specific constellations. So do all the gods in the Norse myths, including Odin, and Thor, and Baldur, and Tyr, and Freyr, and Freya, as well as the Midgard Serpent, and Fenris the Wolf, and the Jotuns, and the other figures who appear in the ancient stories. However, in order to even understand this evidence, we need to be able to envision the constellations. And the fact is that most people cannot envision the constellations at all. They're not taught to us in school, they're not discussed in the media or in the movies, and if you look them up on Wikipedia or an app, you'll usually see an outline that's completely useless <laughs> for understanding the connection between the myths and the stars. That's why if I were to ask you to envision in your mind the stars of Capricorn or of Aries, or of Centaurus, or Ophiuchus, or Sagittarius, or Aquila, the vast majority of people would probably draw a blank. If I handed you a sheet of paper and asked you to sketch out the major stars of any of those constellations, would you be able to do it? Or even if I handed you a sheet of paper with the main stars, of one of those constellations already drawn in on the page and told you which constellation it is and asked you to draw the lines that connect those stars to make the outline of that constellation. Would you be able to draw the lines between the stars to make the outline of Capricorn or Aries or uh, Gemini? If you don't feel like you'd be comfortable doing that, don't feel bad. It's not your fault. For whatever reason, we have generally been kept in complete ignorance of the outlines of the constellations that would unlock the rather overwhelming and even, in some cases, obvious connections between the stories and characters of the Bible, for example, and the stars that you can see in the night sky this very evening. However, it doesn't have to be that way. The famous author 
H. A. Ray, in 1952, published a wonderful book on the stars and how to see the constellations, which is still in print to this day, and as it happens, he appears to have either known the ancient system, although he never mentioned it, he appears to have either known this ancient system of envisioning the constellations, which is used in the myths and even found in the sacred artwork of surviving uh, artifacts around the world, including ancient Greek pottery, but also sculptures and uh, stone reliefs around the world. He appears to have either known that system or else to have thought in the same way that the ancients thought and to have come up with the same system all by himself. I grew up using that system to look at the stars. And if you use this system, you'll not only become familiar with the stars in the night sky and able to go out and find the constellations and enjoy the glorious display in the heavens during any season of the year, but you'll also be able to understand what I'm talking about when I say that the figure of David in the Old Testament corresponds to the constellation Hercules, and that his son Solomon corresponds to the constellation Ophiuchus, and so on. If you're able to go out every night, even for just a few minutes, outside, under the actual stars, especially if you can get to a reasonably dark location, with a reasonably good view of the heavens, without a lot of trees or buildings right next to you, you will start to become familiar with the constellations that populate our night sky if you have a good system of outlining and envisioning those constellations, such as the superlative system that was published and preserved by H.A. Ray. In the past, I've used the metaphor of going to a bar or a pub, or a tavern, perhaps in a new town where you've just moved and where you don't know anyone yet. And when you first start going to this bar, let's say, everyone will look like a complete stranger. And so will the stars in the night sky the first time you go out and start looking at them. But if you keep going back to that bar, night after night, and week after week, after a while, people will start to look familiar to you and you'll start to recognize where they like to sit and what their different personalities are. And before too long, some of them will start to become your friends. And if you go back regularly for a long time, after a while, everyone will know your name and you will start to know everyone there. And it's the same for the heavens you'll start to recognize one or two constellations and then you'll start to meet more and more. And after a while, they'll become your old friends and you will know all about where they like to sit, how they move, how they move across the sky through the course of a night and through the course of a year. And unlike going to a bar every night, <laughs> it's pretty much free to go out and look at the stars. And it doesn't have any negative impact on your health <laughs> or your uh, family life. In fact, it might even be good for you to let starlight into your eyes on a regular basis if you're at all able to do so. So tonight, since it is the beginning of August and the constellation Scorpio is dominating the night sky, I'd like to show you how to identify the constellation Scorpio if you don't know how to do that, and also to find the constellation Ophiuchus, who is directly above Scorpio, such that Ophiuchus can be said to be standing on the head of Scorpio, a arrangement in the sky that actually plays a major role in many star myths around the world. Scorpio is a very bright constellation, and you may already have a good idea how to see this constellation, but let me show it to you here 
on this open source planetarium app called Stellarium. I don't have any connection with Stellarium, but it's an outstanding app that you can download to a laptop or a desktop and it can also be set it can be uh, you can use the settings I'll show you to show the outlines of the stars as described by H.A. Ray in his constellation outlining system so here are the stars of Scorpio okay here we are inside of Stellarium this is Stellarium and I'm going to show you a few things about using Stellarium if you haven't used it before. Um, there's a lot to learn really in this program, but it's a fantastic planetarium app. It's open source, which means that people can go in and add things, such as the outlines of the HA Ray system that I'll show you in a minute. The first thing I always like to do is turn off the atmosphere. So if you have a look down here, this little cloud, that's the atmosphere. I'm going to click that. You can see that the stars become much more visible when we take away the atmospheric effects and I also if you have a version that has the meteor showers I like to get rid of those right away they're very annoying to have those all over the place it might be helpful to know where a meteor shower is coming from if you're trying to find a meteor shower but otherwise I would turn that off and then over here you've got the sky and viewing options window this is a really important window and the date time window so I always turn that on and this is today and the current time so it's actually lining up the stars and I've got us facing to the south if I scroll out just a little bit you can see east and west east will be to the left if I'm facing south and west will be to the right and I'm in the northern hemisphere you can see I'm at plus 35 degrees latitude latitude 35 north so to look towards the zodiac I'm going to have to look to the south because I am north of the equator and I'm north of the ecliptic um, the plane of the ecliptic so to look towards the zodiac I'm gonna to have to look towards the south so I'm next going to turn off all these uh, star names as well so I'm gonna do that in sky and viewing options I come over here I take off the labels and markers on the stars and We'll leave them on for the planets. I wish I could turn them off for uh, asteroids like Vesta, but they basically treat that as a planet in the newer versions of Stellarium. And then I'm going to go over here to Star Lore. And here I can choose, instead of the outlining system, the standard Western outlining system, which is really not very helpful, here's the standard outlining system from the Western. Um, in the app this is just really useless this is not a good outline for Aquarius right here that's totally useless but if we go over here to HA Ray you can see on the uh, star lore function we can change it to HA Ray and now this outline of Aquarius is going to help you understand the connections to the ancient myths where they talk about a headlong runner that's because Aquarius looks like uh, someone who's running at top speed through the sky if you have the right outlining system here's the Western outlining system you'd never figure out what on earth I'm talking about if I say oh yeah Aquarius here's this figure who's described as being a fast runner and that's Aquarius and you look at this and say what on earth are you talking about or what in the universe are you talking about but if you go here to H.A. Ray's outline system you can see what's going on and you can see in ancient pottery images of Aquarius figures who have this outline and it's the same for other constellations so um, so now I've got the lines for uh, the constellations drawn in with H.A. Ray and I'm going to actually bump up the thickness of the lines just for purposes of this video you don't need to do this at home unless you want to you can get them up to a thickness of two or three and you can change the colors if you want I'll leave them as green and now we can start talking about the constellation Scorpio which I was going to introduce tonight in this video and Scorpio so it's going to look much larger relatively speaking in the heavens when you actually go outside and that's because Stellarium is going to uh, create kind of an optical illusion for you by making the east and the west wrap around if we um, let's go to 
Let's go to uh, daylight here so you can see the horizon. So the horizon is actually wrapping around. So the constellations that are to our left and to our right are going to actually be made to look larger to simulate as if we're inside of an aquarium. So if I turn towards the east, then those constellations will get smaller because they're farther away. They're in the center of the sky that I'm looking at. And the, to wrap around, it's going to make the constellations look bigger on the sides. So you'll have to get used to that feature, but um, there are different lenses you can use in Stellarium, but I like this lens right here where it wraps around. But uh, the reason I'm going into this is to explain that when you see Scorpio in the night sky, it's going to look huge. When it's crossing over the, the due south position, and it's, it's at its highest in the sky, it's really large. It's going to look something like this in the night sky really a large constellation. It's beautiful. It's a dazzling constellation. So let's take off those outlines by clicking right here. These are the outlines. I can put the I can put the uh, uh, constellation labels on in Stellarium if I want. I don't like that. And I can take off the outlines. So now you can see these are the stars as you'll see them in the night sky. These are the stars of, of Scorpio. And so how are we going to locate Scorpio? Well, you, you could use Stellarium to help you know, well, it's crossing over the south at you know, 10 p.m. In, in your latitude. But um, the Milky Way, you can see the Milky Way right here. This is the brightest, thickest portion of the Milky Way right here. So the Scorpio is located right in that brightest or right part of it in that brightest part of the Milky Way. You can also bump up the Milky Way. If you go over to Sky and Viewing Options, you can make the Milky Way thicker if you want. Right here, you can make it brighter. So as you can see as I'm doing that, the Milky Way is getting brighter and brighter. So you can really see where is the Milky Way. This is, if you're in the middle of the desert somewhere, you'll really see the Milky Way. Beautiful Milky Way. Now everything that I'm telling you, if you're living in the middle of an inner city, you're not going to be able to see this kind of detail in the sky unless you get out somewhere where there's some uh, darkness and away from light pollution, but it actually doesn't matter for understanding the myths. You can understand what I'm talking about in terms of the myths being connected to the stars just by understanding what the constellations look like and what their different characteristics are. So. Scorpio is going to be located right near the brightest, thickest part of the Milky Way. And right now, we happen to have Jupiter not too far in front of Scorpio. So here in 2018, in August, Jupiter is directly in front of the front portion of Scorpio. So Scorpio is this huge, you could think of it as a letter J. This is like the top of a J and then it curves around like a big J, a big capital J in the sky, or a giant fish hook. This is the fish hook of Maui. This is, this is why the indigenous people of the Pacific wear a fish hook around their necks sometimes. It's a symbol of Maui. Maui is associated with Scorpio. I talk about that in some of my books and blog posts. But this beautiful constellation, really glorious when you can see the whole constellation Scorpio. The farther north you go, the more Scorpio uh, tends to be part of it underneath the horizon. So right now when it's crossing due south, for those of us in the northern hemisphere, that's the highest it's going to get above the horizon. This is Scorpio. So let's draw those lines back in. Here's the Scorpio outlines as H.A. Ray envisions it. Here's the two pinchers of the scorpion and then this big long tail making, making this like letter J. If, if you connect all these lines, which in the sky you'll see these stars make, it's almost like a giant T or a capital J. Then it hooks all the way around. It's a big beautiful constellation and right here these two little stars close together right at the barb of the tail right where there's a stinger of the scorpion. These are very close together in the sky and they're called the cat's eyes. Actually that was annotated right here. Those are the cat's eyes and they play a role in some 
uh, ancient myth. So let's take that back off. And then if we uh, take the take the outlining system off again, you can see those stars of Scorpio. This is what you can see in the sky. You may not be able to see all of the multiple heads of Scorpio, but another way I like to envision Scorpio is this sinuous form here. I don't always um, draw it in my books with these two claws because actually the ancients seem to have envisioned Scorpio as having multiple heads, lines going out to each of these stars, not just in claws, but as a multi-headed serpent, such as the Hydra, which has nine heads. So sometimes Scorpio will have three heads. You'll be able to see at least three of these stars really clearly right up here. Three heads actually plays the role of Kerberos or Cerberus, the, the hound that guards the gates of the underworld in Greek myth. I know it seems strange for a scorpion constellation to play Cerberus or Kerberos, but I uh, actually, the, the Latin Romans pronounced it with a hard C actually, uh, Kerberos, but we usually call it Cerberus, the dog with three heads. But anyway, you can see the three heads of Scorpio really easily, even on a hazy night. But if you get out to a beautiful dark night, you'll see that Scorpio actually has multiple heads. And that plays an important role in a lot of constellations. So let's zoom out a little bit. Here's Scorpio in the center of the sky, Sagittarius and Scorpio on either side of the brightest part of the Milky Way right here. And right above the head of Scorpio is the constellation Ophiuchus with a central body that looks like a obelisk, like a rectangle, an oblong rectangle with a triangular head, almost like a tombstone in the sky. It plays the role of a gate, like the gates to the underworld. That's why Kerberos right here is guarding the gates of the underworld in a lot of myths. Ophiuchus plays a gate, but a lot of myths, Ophiuchus plays a, uh, a figure, not always a male figure, it could be a male figure or a female figure, holding two of something. Sometimes it's two spears, sometimes it's two serpents, sometimes it's two lions, actually. Uh, sometimes it's two wiggly lines <laughs> of some sort or another. But this, uh, Ophiuchus is called Ophiuchus, it means the serpent handler, or the super, serpent holder, the serpent bearer. This is uh, officially one big serpent that Ophiuchus is holding with two halves. This is the tail end of the serpent. This is the head end of the serpent here. So let's see how to spot that in the night sky. If you're able to find Scorpio, here's the beautiful, large, glorious Scorpio right now in the summer months, northern hemisphere. It's summer right now in August. This red star Antares is the, uh, the heart of the scorpion there. You can see this in the night sky really easily. If you're looking towards the south from the northern hemisphere, there's Antares. That name means the anti-Aries, the opposite of Mars, the rival to Mars. Here's right now Mars is this red planet, really big and brilliant. Never seen it this big and brilliant. In 2018, we have this glorious uh, view of Mars. So Mars, the red planet. Antares, the red star in Scorpio rivals anti-Aries or Mars. So it's named that, the star gets that name because it's the rival to Mars. Mars isn't always right here next to the Scorpio. Mars travels, wanders through all the zodiac uh, constellations, but uh, right now it's actually in Capricorn over here. There's Capricorn, that's the tail of the goat right there. Mars is moving. Um, through the constellations. But anyway, above Scorpio is the constellation Ophiuchus. So let's see how to spot that when you don't have the lines. When you're looking out in the night sky, you don't get these helpful lines uh, when you're looking up into the heavens. But if you look above Scorpio, you will see this rectangle in this oblong rectangle and with a triangular head or the triangular capstone above the rectangle right above Scorpio and you can go out and find that now it's not going to be 
straight up all the time. See, here's the horizon. Here's Scorpio right here. Here's Ophiuchus above the triangle in this oblong shape. These are the pretty much the brightest stars in Ophiuchus. You can see this pretty easily. Let's draw in the lines. But it's not always going to be straight up. If I go earlier in the evening, here's my date time. Here we have it, 8.15 p.m. on August 4th. If I go back, if I start going back in time, if I wind them back, I'll go back to 6 p.m., you can see that Ophiuchus is, uh, lies down next to the horizon as it's rising. And then as it climbs up into the sky, it'll become more vertical. So when Scorpio is dead center in the southern direction, Ophiuchus is almost straight up and down. But earlier, Ophiuchus will be leaning towards that eastern horizon when he rises, he or she. Uh, when he rises up from the eastern horizon, he's lying down, becomes more and more vertical, and then as he sets, or she, sets into the west, starts to lie back down again. But anyway, right now, in the middle of the southern direction, this is the highest. The stars rise in the east. They cross over the, the zodiac signs, cross over the southern uh, meridian here. That's where they make their highest arc, and then they set back down in the west. So here is Ophiuchus, and the way to spot it is to look for that triangle, this rectangle and this triangle above Scorpio. And, and as you get used to spotting Ophiuchus, you'll really be able to see that. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit and turn the lines back off. There's that triangle. There's that rectangle. And down here is Scorpio. Look at how Scorpio is really big and bright, bigger than this in the night sky. And then above is this rectangle of Ophiuchus and this larger triangle. Now, don't get confused and see this little triangle here that's kind of on the side of the bigger triangle. See this little triangle? That's formed by the foot of the constellation Hercules. I'm going to talk about Hercules another night. But see that? Hercules has his foot, or her foot. Sometimes Hercules plays a female figure too. Hercules has the foot, one foot, the forward foot, next to the head of Ophiuchus and reaching down towards the serpent over here, the serpent head on this half of Ophiuchus. But you can see all this of Ophiuchus on a dark night. Now is a great time to see Scorpio, Ophiuchus, Hercules we'll talk about later. But you see this little triangle here? That's like the, the false triangle. Don't get, don't, don't get sucked into that triangle. When you're looking for Ophiuchus, this is the triangle we're talking about. But you might be able to spot them both if you go out now and take a look. Let's turn off those lines one more time. Scorpio, multi-headed. See those multi-heads? Sometimes eight heads, sometimes nine heads, sometimes seven heads, sometimes only three heads. Scorpio plays a figure with multiple heads a lot. Maui actually has eight heads in some of the versions of the legend. That's why his mother and father throw him into the sea foam. The sea foam being, in this case, the Milky Way. They toss him into the sea. He has to be rescued by his powerful grandfather. That's actually Hercules grabs Maui out of the sea and rescues him. Here's Maui's mother. This is Virgo. We'll talk about that constellation another night. Virgo looks like she's giving birth. Sometimes she gives birth to Ophiuchus is sometimes her uh, child. Sometimes it's uh, Scorpio. But... Um, that's why Maui gets thrown into the sea foam. Here's the sea foam on the edge of the beach, the Milky Way. Because he has eight heads, he scares his parents in some versions of that story. So I'm going to take those stars lines back off so you can just see the stars. Tonight we're focusing on Scorpio and above, this rectangle of Ophiuchus, triangle. And then from there you can uh, go out to the... Um, the head end of the serpent that Ophiuchus is carrying and the tail end right over here. Sometimes there's figures with two spears in myth. That's often an Ophiuchus figure if there's two spears. In fact, 
any spear carrying character is often ophiuchus because this right here you can envision this is almost a straight line you don't have to make this bend right here so sometimes this is the rod or the spear carried by ophiuchus when uh, Moses stretches out his rod over the Red Sea here's the Red Sea that's Milky Way makes a pathway across it there's there's the pathway across the Red Sea right there this dark rift the rod of Moses. So Ophiuchus is an incredibly important constellation. If you can go out and start to locate it in the night sky, very satisfying. But even if you are not in the position to go out and see the stars tonight or this week when it's great viewing for Scorpio and Ophiuchus this month, this time of year, if you understand this outline, then what I'm talking about when I start explaining the myths, connecting to specific constellations will start to make more sense. I hope. I hope that uh, hope that's helpful.